Hello, Prime members. You can listen to British Scandal one week early and ad-free on Amazon Music or via the Wondery Plus subscription on the Wondery app or Apple Podcasts. Just to let you know, this episode contains very strong language. Please be advised. Hi, Alice. Hi, Matt. I'm really excited. I love a new series. So what's this one about? Well, I think this series is going to give you a lot of satisfaction. Okay, vague. Um, I'd quite like it to be a political one. I think that would be nice. Well, you can't always get what you want. And you may have guessed this one is about a band. Why would I guess? Will the listeners like this one? Wild horses will not be able to drag the listeners away from this series. Okay, you're talking in riddles and you're acting really weird. So should we just get going? Start me up. 3rd of July, 1969. Cotchford Farm, Hartfield, Sussex. It's a balmy summer evening. 24-year-old Anna Volin is wearing a loose-fitting cotton dress. Her hair is still damp with chlorine. She lies on her stomach on the creaky brass bed with its faded patchwork throw, legs crossed behind her, flicking through a magazine. She glances out of the window, taking in the verdant tree line pushing into the darkening sky. She loves Cotchford Farm. It belongs to her boyfriend, Brian Jones, the guitarist of the Rolling Stones. The house is beautiful, a sprawling country pile clad with orange tiles. Inside, it's a maze of uneven floors and vaulted ceilings, with floral paper lining the walls and pink frilly curtains. Not exactly rock and roll. Not exactly nice. Something's happened to Brian! Anna sits bolt upright as a frantic voice calls up the stairs. Anna left Brian doing lengths of his swimming pool in the twilight with Frank, the builder he's employed to renovate the house. The choked agitation in the voice frightens Anna. She immediately scrambles off the bed, racing down the stairs. In the dim garden lights, Anna can just about make out a dark shape, still at the bottom of the swimming pool. She dives straight in, fully clothed. Frank follows. The water stings her eyes and nose. Her hands brush his body. Deep down, she knows it's Brian. She grabs him tightly by the arms. Frank takes his legs. They both kick their way to the surface. Frank clambers out of the pool and helps her drag Brian onto the concrete. He's limp and pale, but she thinks she feels the faint throb of a pulse. She shakes Brian's shoulders, but his eyes roll back into his head, vacant. Brian, please! She starts breathing into his mouth, pounding his chest. One, two, three, screaming for the ambulance making silent plea bargains with God. Minutes tick by. She feels Frank's eyes bearing into her. Finally, he says flatly, Anna, he's dead. From Wondery, I'm Alice Levine. And I'm Matt Ford. And this is British Scandal, the show where we bring you stories from this green and not always so pleasant land. British scandals come in many shapes and sizes. Some are about money, some are about sex. They're all about power. But when we look at scandals a bit closer, they turn out to be stranger, wilder, just plain weirder than we remember. So we're journeying back to ask who's to blame for what happened. And when the dust settled, did anything really change? So, Alice, you need to get out your old prefect badge today, which I know you keep in your bedside drawer, because we're talking about some anti-establishment figures in the world of music. Okay, well, that's where you're wrong. I keep it on my coat. And also, it's a head girl badge. But anyway, let's not get bogged down in the details. So we've done Sex Pistols. We've done the Beatles. Who have you got? These are effectively the anti-Beatles. This is the story of the Rolling Stones and the troubled musician at the heart of it, Brian Jones. Oh, interesting, because I obviously think of Mick Jagger or Keith Richards, as probably a lot of people do, but I don't know much about Brian Jones. Yes, the vast majority of people, the Rolling Stones is Mick Jagger and Keith Richards, but without Brian Jones, the band would not have existed as we know it. He started the band as a teenager, and then seven years later, it was all over for him. Okay, so I'm expecting a story with tragedy, obviously, excitement, glamour, Maybe even conspiracy theories? Yes, we're going to explore the relationships and rivalries within the biggest rock and roll band of the swinging 60s. 
This is episode one, Who's the Leader? I Love My Kid, But is a new comedy parenting podcast from Wondery that shares a refreshingly honest and insightful take on parenting. Each week, the host will share a parenting story that'll have you laughing and thinking, yes, I have absolutely been there. Listen to I Love My Kid, But on Amazon Music or wherever you get your podcasts. 7th of April, 1962, G Club, Ealing Broadway. In the nightclub toilets, posters peel from the sticky walls and water pools across the cracked, tiled floor. No thanks, not for me. 20-year-old Brian Jones elbows his way to the mirror. Squinting in the dim light, he smooths his crisp Italian box jacket, runs a comb through his sleek blonde hair, and tries to stop his hands from shaking. The G Club might be a tiny room under a bakery in Ealing, but Brian's dreamed of performing here for years. When he was 16, he got his girlfriend pregnant and was kicked out of his respectable grammar school in disgrace. He left home and went travelling through Northern Europe, busking on the streets for money. I mean, that is one way to support your family. When he had to eventually admit he was broke, he came back to England, determined to pursue a life as a bohemian blues musician, vowing never again to abide by the conformist rules of his upbringing. So with no qualifications and no plan B, He's left his three children by three different women and mundane life in Cheltenham behind to move to London and try and make it as a musician. And tonight, he's supporting one of his heroes, blues musician Alexis Corner. He's been practising for weeks. And, most importantly, he's found the perfect partner. Paul Pond is an English undergrad at Jesus College, Oxford. Finally, Brian thinks he's found someone who matches his musical talent and his passion for blues music. As the last notes of Alexis Corner's band die away and the interval begins, Paul kicks open the toilet door. They're ready for us! Brian takes a deep breath to settle his racing heart, puts on his shades, picks up his shiny Gibson and heads onto stage. Smoke chokes the basement. It stings Brian's eyes and catches in the back of his throat. Most of the audience are queuing for the bog or getting drinks at the bar. Sweating, Brian thumbs the intro to Elmore James's Dust My Broom. But it's all but drowned out by chatter. Brian takes a deep breath and decides to take a big risk. He turns his back and plays facing away from the audience. He's hoping it looks moody, cool, but he really wants to hide his nerves. Have you ever tried that with comedy? I do it in here, don't I? I just face the wall when I record my bits. But we ask you to do that. <laughs> Finally, the moment comes for Brian's slide guitar solo. All of a sudden, he hears the crowd behind him quietly. For the rest of the song, it's like there's an electric connection between him and his audience. He feels so seen up here, so powerful. They're hanging on his every note. As Brian steps off stage, Alexis Corner grabs his arm and grins. Same time next week. Beaming, Brian floats into the grotty labs. He bear hugs Paul. We've got another slot. But he's shocked to see Paul's face fall. Easter holidays are nearly over. I'll be back at university by then. Brian can't believe what he's hearing. He pleads with Paul to jack it in, start a band with him. They could really be something. Based on one request to come back. I mean, this is why I would never be a rock star, because I'd be too afraid to like miss a seminar or something. It's true. It's the only reason you're not It is the well. only reason. Paul shakes his head. You're wasting your time, Brian. No one's going to listen to our music. You can forget that. Brian stares at Paul in disbelief. He's finally reached a point where he's being offered gigs and he no longer has a band. He turns away in disgust, slamming through the door into the club. He vows never to be in this position again. He needs to shape a new band around him. And this time, he's going to make sure he's the one pulling the strings. Hard to vow to never be in that position again because is there a more volatile union than being in a band? Uh, podcast double act. <laughs> Do you think of us as a double act? I think of you as a sidekick. <laughs> <laughs> I'll settle for that. <laughs> the same day, G Club, Ealing Broadway. Who the hell is this guy? Keith Richards doesn't want to admit it to himself but he can't take his eyes off the guitarist with the slick blonde hair. 
This guy looks like he doesn't give a shit about anything. He played his set with his back to the audience, proper Robert Johnson style, and now he's hunched over moodily on a corner table with a glass of whiskey, the shiny Gibson guitar propped up at his feet. The way he played that thing up there, slide guitar, like something straight out of Chicago. Keith's mate, Mick Jagger, is buzzing in his ear. Mick is long-haired with voluptuous lips that make the girls go wild. But right now, he's getting on Keith's tits, banging on about catching the last train back home. Come on! <laughs> oh my God, it's even better than I could have imagined. Dartford is the last place Keith wants to be right now, so he shuts him down quickly. Shut the fuck up, will you? This place is cool. He downs the dregs of his half pint and swaggers jauntily over to the guitarist. Thought you were great up there. Never seen anything like it. Like Elmore James was in the room. I'm Keith. All right, I'm Mick. Mick barrels in after Keith and thrusts his sweaty hand at the guy. At first he looks taken aback and then vaguely amused. Finally, he mutters, Brian. Keith takes this as an invitation to join. He coolly pulls up a stool and asks Brian if he'll be back next week. But Brian's face darkens. He can't, because he's lost his bloody band. Uh, we're a band. Keith feels Mick dig him hard in the ribs. He's not exactly lying. They've just started messing around together, calling themselves Little Boy Blue. Truth be told, they're not exactly great. When they sent a tape to Alexis Corner at the G Club, he listened to it once, thought it was awful, and then immediately lost it. And they're counting that as a middling review. He listened to it. We got a very promising out of office. But Keith knows they've got something. They just need someone to give them a chance. We're just amateurs, really. Mick's cutting in, his cheeks reddening. But we dig to play. Brian smiles vaguely and gets up. But Keith blocks his path. So what about this band, then? Brian sighs, wary, and hands Keith a piece of paper with the address of the Bricklayer's Arms in Soho. Come give it a shot if you want. It's all Keith can do to keep his cool, as a smile tries to force its way across his face. An opportunity to be part of an actual blues band. Now all he has to do is not fuck it up. June 1962, 102 Edith Grove, Fulham, London. Keith shoves hard at the sticky door. There's a pile of junk mail in front of it, and he has to put his full weight behind it to finally get it open. He peers into the half-lit room. He wasn't sure what he was expecting, but it wasn't this. He dumps his suitcase and guitar on the stained threadbare carpet, dodging the rusty tacks. A stale fug hangs in the air. Fungus grows out of unwashed crockery in the so-called kitchen, and mold-soaked paper peels off the walls. So you're looking at, what, two and a half grand a month? In the whole place, there are only two stained, sunken mattresses. The rest of them will have to sleep on the floor. But Keith's delighted. He's been desperate to escape the picket-fence suburban drudgery of his mum's well-kept home in Dartford. He excitedly pokes around his grotty new flat. Instruments, amps and blues records are piled up in every corner. The audition process was ugly. Two other band members left when they heard Mick and Keith had been selected, accusing them of not being proper blues artists. But clearly Brian had sensed they had something in them, however rough. Or he thought he could boss Mick and Keith around. Either way, after making them promise they'd work their bollocks off, he'd welcome them to the band. Brian whacks a mouldy pan with a splintering wooden spoon to call their first rehearsal to order. Keith unclips his case, picks up his guitar and starts playing the opening chords of his favourite Chuck Berry song, nodding at Mick to start singing. Chuck is their hero. Without Chuck, they wouldn't still be mates. They lost touch as kids when Mick's family moved. They only got together again a couple of years ago, when Keith spotted Mick holding a Chuck Berry album at the train station. Oh my God, it's like a beautiful rom-com moment. But Brian shouts at Keith to shut it. Who even is this? Keith's about to passionately tell him exactly who Chuck is. But Brian silences him with a glare and starts reeling off roles like a schoolmaster. Mix the singer, I'm the singer and lead guitar. Keith cuts in. Oh, I'm lead guitar, always have been. He turns to Mick, who gets ready to back him up. But Brian's resolute. It's my band. 
If you don't like it, piss off back to Dartford. Keith's torn. He's desperate for this band to work. And remembering his slide guitar at the G Club, Keith can't deny Brian is the real deal. But still, he's not having Brian think he can push him around. So he doggedly shoves his guitar back into the case and stomps towards the door. Mick hesitates for a minute before getting up to follow. Wait, hang on. Keith hides a smirk as Brian rushes over and blocks their path. His risk paid off. Brian needs them as much as they need him. Brian says they can sort this. There's this technique, weaving, he calls it. Keith's never heard of it. Brian explains that it involves blurring the lines between the lead and rhythm guitar, blending them into one seamless sound. I'm deeply unmusical, but is that very hard to do? Is that very special? It's an old technique taken from black blues music, but this is really the Rolling Stones' legacy. They were the first white band to make music this way, and the rhythm guitar traditionally is playing the chords and then lead is doing all the melody. To think that you could do both those things at the same time and then two of you could alternate seamlessly is really, really difficult. Keith yawns. Sounds like a bloody music lesson. All he wants to do is play good songs. But this time, Brian isn't backing down. Look, I'll show you. Uh, what was that song you were playing? Keith mutters the name of the track. Uh, I'm talking about you. It sounded pretty good. Um, let's try it with that. Keith nods vaguely, but inside he's glowing. Brian likes his music. Taking his guitar back out of the case, he sits cross-legged on the floor next to Brian and begins to play. It starts out of joint, but within minutes, he can't tell which notes are coming out of his Gibson or Brian's. The pair of them are playing in total, complete synergy. This is it, Keith thinks. This band is going to be something really special. July 1962, 102 Edith Grove, Fulham, London. Brian paces in a circle, tying himself in knots with a phone cord, dodging dirty clothes and congealed plates on the floor. So they've had a tidy up. For the past month, his new band have lived and breathed music, playing their favourite R&B songs over and over, dissecting every note, working out the science of them, what makes them work, and then coming up with their own covers. He's sure they're ready to play their own set. But the owner of the Marquee Club, the best underground venue on Oxford Street, is proving hard to convince. It's been said we're the best blues band outside of Chicago. Brian smiles cockily. He doesn't add that they're the only ones who have said it. Well, I've never heard of you. What are you even called? Brian's heart thumps. He'll look like a right amateur if he admits they don't even have a name. His foot strays onto a Muddy Waters album left on the floor. He staggers to stop himself cracking it. Hello? Are you still there? Brian's eyes fall on a track from the album, Rolling Stone Blues. Brian sits on an amp in the dressing room, going over and over the set list on a crumpled piece of paper. Jimmy Reed, Fats Domino, Elmore James, Chuck Berry. Names have been scribbled out, thick pencil arrows rearrange the order. But now, finally, the list is perfect. Brian's Cuban heels click against the vinyl with nervous anticipation. The marquee club's owner sticks his head round the chipped wooden door. He eventually let Brian talk him into giving them a slot. One night only. But Brian's convinced, once he's seen them, he'll be begging for more. Get a move on, then. Brian leaps to his feet and grabs his guitar. But the club owner is staring oddly at Mick and Keith. Are they all right? Brian looks at Mick, trying and failing to light a cigarette with a trembling hand. Meanwhile, Keith is splashing his skinny face with water in the sink. Brian realises he might be used to playing open mics and blues clubs in London, but he'd forgotten that before he met Mick and Keith, they were basically amateurs. The band filed towards the wings in silence. Brian tries to G them up. They've rehearsed hard for this. They're ready. But he can see Mick craning to look over his shoulder, staring wide-eyed at the crowd, slowly assembling in front of the stage. They walk out on stage. Keith picks up his guitar and starts playing the intro to Confessing the Blues, with his eyes firmly fixed on the floor. When Mick comes in with the lyrics, he looks like a wooden doll, arms pinned firmly at his sides, 
staring vacantly into the middle distance. It's so strange to think of Mick Jagger not swinging his arms and legs all over the shop. I mean, swagger is obviously what you think of. It's mad to imagine these guys ever being nervous. Or young. <laughs> Brian can see the club owner looking at his watch. Groups of girls drifting to the loo. He has to do something, anything. So he goes mad. OK, that's one option. Leaping around the stage, pulling faces at men in the audience like he's spoiling for a fight. People start laughing, clapping. Mick's face chips into a smile. He starts moving his feet about a little. The pace of Keith's guitar picks up. Their guitar-weaving innovation starts to properly come together. The crowd are losing their minds now. A couple of girls even try to climb up onto stage. Brian's grinning. He's never felt energy like this. Finally, he's got a real blues band that properly gels. The bohemian lifestyle he's been dreaming of since his teens. The music, fans, never felt so within his grasp. At the end of the song, Brian presses the microphone close to his mouth and tries to shout over the raucous, screaming crowd. We are the Rolling Stones! Summer is finally here, which means the great outdoors are hotter, more humid, and filled with bugs. Actually, come to think of it, there's no better way to spend the summer than in air-conditioned comfort while listening to your favorite podcasts. Discover the summer of podcast with two months free of Wondery Plus. With Wondery Plus, you get early and ad-free access to your favorite podcasts. You can also listen to our entire library of award-winning, binge-worthy shows. That's thousands of hours of captivating content in any genre you like. From true crime to business, comedy, sports, history, and even podcasts for the whole family. With Wondery Plus, you also get access to special live events found nowhere else, as well as discounts in the Wondery shop. Summer is a time to relax and unwind by binging your favorite podcasts. So don't let the summer of podcasts pass you by. Right now, new subscribers can enjoy two months free of Wondery Plus. Visit Wondery.com or download the Wondery app to get started. First of May, 1963. Crawdaddy Club, Richmond. 19-year-old Andrew Lug Oldham can't believe his eyes. He's standing on a street in Richmond with its sculpted shrubbery, white entrance columns and top-of-the-range cars. But the entire length of it is lined with teenagers. Girls in miniskirts bargain with the bouncers, promising to stay on their boyfriend's shoulders if they're allowed entry. Boys in Cuban heels jostle and shove their way to the front. An older woman crosses the road to avoid the ruckus, shaking her head at the girl's haircuts and hemlines. Andrew goes to these sorts of gigs all the time. He's desperate to make his mark as a manager in the music industry. He just needs to find the right band. He wasn't expecting much from the Rolling Stones tonight, a group of lads who play blues covers. But by the look of this crowd, there might be something special about them. It's absolutely bonkers to think that this is word of mouth. Now people have social media, the internet. You have ways of getting your music and your message out there. This is just absolutely crazy. Inside, sweat steams off the tightly packed bodies. Andrew smooths his suit jacket. His sleeve is already soaked in someone else's beer. When the band finally spills out onto stage, their fans scream so loud Andrew can hardly hear the music. He catches fragments of skillful jazz drumming, rough and ready slide guitar, and bow diddly rhythms so tight they could have come from the man himself. During instrumentals, singer Mick Jagger breaks off into odd little sprightly dancers that send the crowd wild. The girl next to him passes out in the heat and excitement. As he helps pass her limp body towards the stage, Andrew knows he's come across something extraordinary. These guys have got blues roots, yes, but this is also sex with a capital S. Now all he has to do is persuade them to take him on as their manager. Straightening his tie, Andrew swaggers past security with public school charm and sticks his head into the smoke-filled dressing room. That was just fantastic, boys. They don't reply. Good start. The guitarist, Brian Jones, fixes him with a disconcerting direct stare. It's all Andrew can do to keep his composure as he starts wittering on about just how much potential they have, 
how wild the crowd were tonight, how successful they could be, if they take him on as their manager. The boys break out into laughter. Keith Richards asks, <laughs> And you're what, eight? Andrew draws himself up to his full height, inwardly cursing his hairless chin. I'm being serious here. Within two years, I really think I can make you bigger than the Beatles, and better, cooler, like a kind of anti-Beatles. The laughter gets louder. So with a deep breath, Andrew blurts out that his last job was with Brian Epstein. OK, now we're talking. Thinking on his feet, he gabbles about the time with Epstein as though the pair of them are best friends. He doesn't mention that he wasn't allowed anywhere near the Beatles, or that he was fired. I would say irrelevant details. Keep it top line. When they hear Epstein's name, something changes in the boys' faces. Finally, ignoring a furious glance from Brian, Keith Richards says, Maybe we should hear him out. Andrew feels a smile spread across his face. He knows he's winning them round. Now, he just has to get Brian Jones on his side. October 1963, Delane Lee Studios, Dean Street, London. Keith slams his guitar down in frustration. After another day in the recording studio, the Stones have absolutely nothing. Despite his initial reservations, Brian agreed to let Andrew manage them. But Keith's noticed that Brian's been sullen and difficult about any suggestion Andrew makes. And we're not far into this working relationship, are we? Why do I sense that this can only get worse? Despite this, and all thanks to Andrew's promotion, their first single, a cover of Chuck Berry's Come On, rose to number 21 in the UK hit parade. Now they want to top it. The problem is, they've got no songs. They need something big enough people will have heard of it, but not so big it's already been covered too many times. But Brian is drawing a blank. And Keith knows they've got nothing original because none of them write their own songs. <coughs> Suddenly, the studio door whooshes open. Keith looks up, surprised, to see Andrew standing in the doorway, waving his arms around excitedly. Two hours ago, he'd stormed angrily out of the studios, frustrated by their lack of progress. But now his cheeks are flushed and shiny with drink, and an almost comically large smile is spread across his boyish face. Look who I just bumped into on Charing Cross Road! Andrew gestures flamboyantly to two men, both in long coats with distinctive dark mop tops and guitars slung over their shoulders. Keith's jaw drops when he realises who is standing in front of them. John Lennon and Paul McCartney. No way! Andrew explains that after running into them on the street, he took the pair for a pint and told them about their no-songs problem. They think they've got something that might be right for us. I think it's right. Whatever it is, we'll have it. Keith rolls his eyes when he sees Brian jump to his feet. Of course he's got something to say. We can't use a Beatles song. We're a blues band, for fuck's sake. Brian, can I have a word over here, please, behind my hand? Thank you. Keith cuts in, rolling his eyes. Oh, shut up, Brian. We've been here for weeks and we've got nothing worth recording. We might as well hear these guys out. Explaining that the song isn't yet finished... Paul and John carefully unclip their guitar cases and get to work. Keith watches. They might not be his kind of band, but it's enthralling. Their muttered synchronicity as they suggest new lines and chord progressions. It's like they each know what the other is thinking. Keith can't help but be impressed. He feels an arm on his shoulder, turns. Andrew is scooping him and Mick into a hug and murmuring, Pay attention, boys. I want Richards and Jagger writing songs like this one day. Keith suppresses a laugh. He knows bugger all about songwriting. John lifts his head from his guitar, giving them a sleepy grin. All right, lads. This one's called I Wanna Be Your Man. I don't know if I remember that one. It's not a masterpiece. It just sounds like the Stones singing a Beatles song and I Wanna Be Your Man is about the extent of the lyrics. <laughs> so they didn't so much write them a song as give them a title. Listening to the first few chords, Keith feels a note of disappointment. Brian was right. It's well constructed, but it's clearly not a Stones song. But then, to his surprise, he hears the sound of Brian's slide guitar behind him, playing over John and Paul. Suddenly, the song starts to sound like something straight out of Chicago. Keith grabs his own guitar as their drummer Charlie gets a silky jazz beat going. Even Paul and John are looking at Brian in admiration. At the end of the song, Keith puts his arm around Brian. 
He might be a whiner sometimes, but he's not half talented. Listening back to the recording, the whole band are grinning at each other. They finally got a hit on their hands. 19th of October, 1963, Bradford, Yorkshire. As the tour bus leaves the lush steeps of the Yorkshire Dales and thunders into narrow streets packed with sandstone terraces, Keith slides into the seat beside Andrew. He's bored. Since Leeds, Brian's had his guitar out and has been running through their set list with such a pained genius expression on his face that Keith had burst out laughing. Andrew's booked them onto a tour supporting their blues idols, the Everly Brothers, Bo Diddley, Little Richard. And it's like Brian is on some kind of solo mission to prove he too is one of the greats. Brian didn't appreciate Keith mocking him, so Keith's been banished to the front of the bus. Andrew's counting out the takings from last night's gig in Newcastle. He hands Keith his share, eight pounds each. Woohoo! Keith grins, shoving the notes into his pocket. 40 quid a gig? We've made it. Andrew murmurs, distractedly winding rubber bands round wads of cash. Well, 45 pounds. Huh? Andrew notices Keith staring at him, confused. Because of Brian's extra five pounds. Oh, God. Actually, this is a good juncture to ask you a question. What do you get paid per show? Five pounds less than you. Perfect. Great. Carry on. Then Andrew's eyes widen. He puts his hand to his mouth like he wishes he could take his words back. You fucking what? Andrew starts spluttering about compensating Brian for his early management of the band. Management? He booked us a couple of gigs. Uh, Yes, but as the founder, me and Mick were a band way before Brian. The news of the five pounds hits Keith like a punch to the stomach. It all makes sense. Why Brian suddenly backed down and let Andrew manage the band. In those first few months at the Edith Grove flat, things were tough for the Stones. They used to steal potatoes from shops, sell bottles back to off-licensers to turn the electric fire on. Anything they had, they shared it like pirates. And then there was Brian, creaming off extra for himself, like he's better than the rest of them. Obviously, we're talking in old money, so I don't know how much that represents now, but it sort of doesn't matter because it just poisons the well, doesn't it? The trust is gone once you realise that somebody's just out for themselves. A few hours later, Keith stomps off stage, his long hair drenched with sweat. He announces that he's off back to the hotel for a shower. The rest of the band agree to join him and then return to the theatre for the Everly Brothers' last number. But Brian's hesitant. The place is surrounded on three sides by teenagers behind fragile police barriers. People who didn't get tickets, but still want a piece of the stones. But what if they get us? Keith shrugs. Since he found out earlier about the extra five pounds, every word that's come out of Brian's mouth has grated on him. Stay here if you want, then. Shaking his head, Brian follows the rest of them out of the back door of the theatre and across an alley towards their hotel. The crowd is ear-splittingly loud now, screaming, jeering, like a cross between a Beatles concert and a riot. The band almost make it, but suddenly, there's a crash. One of the metal police barriers smashes to the ground. The crowd starts streaming into the alley, heading straight for them. Quick! The band leg it, shaking off grasping hands and muscling their way to the hotel entrance. Someone sticks out their leg to trip Keith up, but a burly hotel security guard drags him to his feet and pulls him inside. There, all of you. Keith looks behind him, sees a flash of Brian's blonde barnet as girls yank at his hair and rip his jacket to shreds. Keith nods, deciding Brian needs teaching a lesson. Yeah, that's all of us. A month later, November 1963, Odeon Hammersmith... London. With ten minutes till showtime, Brian shoves the rest of Keith's roast chicken leftovers back into the dressing room fridge and heads down the twisting narrow corridor to the bogs, licking his fingers. I Wanna Be Your Man was released two days ago and all the signs are positive. The Stones might finally have a top 20 hit on their hands. Brian knows he should be celebrating, but he's been feeling kind of flat recently. He's sure he's going paranoid, but Keith seems off with him. He's about to push open the door when he hears Keith's booming voice from inside. He feels the pit of his stomach drop. 
Five pound extra he's been getting. Who the hell does he think he is? Brian dives back into the dressing room, quietly stewing. Keith and Mick know he set up the band, came up with their name, booked their first gig, turned two gangly boys from Kent into proper performers. He's earned that five pounds. He hears footsteps on the liner. Mick and Keith swagger into the room. Brian studiously pours over fan mail and doesn't look up. He feels Keith's eyes burning into him. Did you take my fucking chicken? Suddenly, Keith's right in front of him, spitting into his face. Brian doesn't understand. They live together for God's sake. They share everything, always have. Yeah, apart from the extra 12.5% that he's pocketing. But suddenly, Keith's dragging Brian to his feet by his oversized shirt collar. Brian feels his breath hot in his face. Think you can take whatever you like, do you? Like you're the only one that matters. A roadie tentatively sticks his head round the dressing room door and mutters that they're on. I'm not sharing a stage with this two-faced fuck. Brian pleads with Keith to calm down, begging him to see reason. Let's just get this gig over with. Suddenly, everything goes black. When the world comes back into focus, Brian realises he's flat out, spitting blood onto the dusty parquet floor. His face throbs and stings. He stares up at Keith. They are meant to be friends, bandmates, to stick together, and Keith just punched him. Fuck you, Brian. With that, Keith and Mick strut out of the room, leaving Brian furiously wiping his bloody mouth on the back of his hand. They've always squabbled, but they've never argued like this. As he hears the roar of the audience, Brian knows he needs to take back control. The fate of the band depends on it. I have to stress, we know, we've talked about on British Scandal, the fate of bands before and the pressures that are on, often young men thrust into the limelight and how it takes its toll, touring, albums, the pressure, the fame, that process can grind you down. It's been 18 months. That's all it's been, 18 months. And they're already knocking each other out. Yeah. Yeah. Twenty seventh of June, nineteen sixty four, the BBC Shepherd's Bush Green. Brian waits anxiously in the wings, running his comb through his hair one final time. Beyond the glaring studio lights, a man with a headset counts everyone in. The live audience falls into an excited hush, but behind him, Andrew whispers, "Remember, go nuts, boys." Keith and Mick snigger loudly. Brian shoots them a look but they ignore him. The band have reconciled after the punch, but things still feel a bit off between Brian and Keith. The Stones' first album, The Rolling Stones, hit number one and is one of the biggest sellers of 1964 so far. And to mark its release, they've been invited onto Jukebox Jewelry. They're going to be asked to listen to new releases, comment on them, and vote whether they think they're a hit or miss. Brian's been really looking forward to this. Andrew is increasingly framing the Stones as a bad boy rock and roll band. With the album's hard, threatening cover photo and the headlines he teases out of the press, he wants to make them scandalous. Which we thank him for. Brian's sick of the gimmicks. He's keen to do some publicity that's actually about the music. As the intro music dies away, the host, in a tailored tweed jacket, welcomes the viewers in clipped RP. Tonight, we've got a very special episode of Jukebox Jury. The host introduces the Rolling Stones. The audience break into enthusiastic applause. Brian strolls onto stage, waving politely. But Keith and Mick saunter out sulkily, looking at their feet like they wish they were anywhere but here. After the first song, the host turns to Mick and asks him what he thinks. It's all right. The host waits but nothing else comes except a titter from Keith. Brian launches into his first well-rehearsed answer, but Keith flat out interrupts him. I'm not mad on it. Mick laughs. (laughs) We think it's a miss, boys. Keith kicks over his chair and swears loudly. Brian's cheeks redden as the host's pleasant smile becomes strained. Keith and Mick are acting like a bunch of kids, slagging off every song and voting the lot of them misses. Brian waits for them to play the next song, 
and then mutters, For fuck's sake, guys, can we not just give some proper answers? But Keith, feet up on the desk, just laughs and tells him to shut it. Brian catches a glimpse of himself in the monitors, the band as a whole, as others must see them. He can't quite believe how the band has changed within two years, since those days guitar weaving on the floor of their squat in Edith Grove. All he can do is sit back as Mick and Keith take charge and wreak utter havoc. June 1965, Portsmouth. Keith's leaning back on the slick leather seat of his limousine, staring absent-mindedly out at the jet black night, when something suddenly catches his eye. He lowers his blacked out windows, sticks his head out into the petrol choked air. Perched precariously on a grassy bank is Brian's old rover. The bonnet is up and smoke is pouring out of it. Brian is standing next to it, waving his arms to get Keith's attention. Keith rolls his eyes and tells his chauffeur to slow down, sighing at the prospect of having to spend the rest of the journey with Brian. Things between Brian and Keith have got worse since the Stones released Satisfaction. The song has just earned them their first number one. After initially struggling in their new role as songwriters, Keith and Mick are on a roll. Keith literally came up with Satisfaction in his sleep. It's a huge hit. Fans sing back every word when they play it on stage. I love that that's a hyperbolic phrase. I could do it in my sleep, but he actually did. Yes, yeah, so he dreams it, wakes up and records it, and then when he listens back to the recording, there's two minutes of the riff and then 40 minutes of him snoring where he'd fallen back to sleep. <laughs> Which I think is actually the album version. But Brian isn't happy about it. Despite having never written songs himself, he clearly thinks he could do a better job of it. When they play it live, he rolls his eyes and vamps... Popeye the Sailor Man. Seeing the limo slow down, Brian is visibly relieved. He gets his guitar case out of the boot, checks the traffic, and then steps towards the car, snidely muttering. Thought you were never coming. Can't believe you leave it so late. I set off an hour and a half ago. With that, Keith decides he can't bear to spend the next hour trapped in a car with Brian, gloating about how much better he is. Keith flips his middle finger out of the car window and yells at his driver to speed off into the night. It's going to be a nightmare playing the gig in Portsmouth with one down, but it'll be worth it to teach Brian a lesson. I tend to agree. It's a great feeling, isn't it? If I was hitchhiking, would you pick me up? I don't know if we've got time to talk about that now, have we? 14th of August, 1965, Belgravia. Brian slams the door of his pokey basement flat and slings his keys into a bowl in the hallway. He's sick and tired of Mick and Keith overruling him in the studio, interrupting him, treating him like he's some kind of massive joke instead of the best musician in the band. He's getting ready to chuck the dirty washing off his sofa, sink into it and switch off for the rest of the day when he hears a familiar rhythm from the flat above. Brian's living below R&B band The Pretty Things and he's pretty sure he can make out the rhythm of the Stones' new EP. Although, he can't be totally sure, because the band are laughing their heads off over it. Brian clenches his fist so hard his knuckles go white. He knows they think he's a sellout, that the Stones are poppy, churning out commercial crap for teenage girls. They think he's ridiculous, a joke. He won't stand for this, not today. Heart thudding in his ears, he grabs the first thing he can lay his hands on, a ukulele, and tears through the door. He takes the stairs in twos and barges straight into the pretty things as airy first floor flat without knocking. He sinks to see the band surrounded by a fog of smoke, listening to his music and cackling, tears rolling down their cheeks. This is an anxiety dream. This is what you imagine when you put something out in the world that's creative. This is basically what you imagine all your worst enemies doing. The drummer, Viv Prince, is grinning at him now. What are you doing, Brian? But Brian's too furious to speak. He holds the ukulele over his head and smashes it down on Viv Prince's head. OK. Suddenly, a commotion breaks out. The band members snatch the ukulele off Brian and yell at him to calm the fuck down. They're stoned, that's all. They all love the LP, honest. But all the rage Brian's been carrying these past six months is flowing out of him now about how he's been quietly sidelined, 
forced by Andrew to pimp himself out in the name of marketing, made to take a back seat in his goddamn band. He starts pulling records at random from a mahogany cabinet and melting them with his lighter. Oh, my God! By now, the band are all on their feet, grabbing at his arms, begging Brian to stop. But he kicks out at them and yells at them to back off. He takes the dripping singles into the bathroom and slaps them against the tiles till they stick. Then he grabs a tube of shaving foam and scrawls a violent message. Catching his breath now, red mist lifting, he strides past the band, glancing over his shoulder to see them in muted shock, reading his shaving foam scrawl. You fucking cunts. That's it. Keith, Mick, Andrew, the label, everyone is going to take him seriously again. He's going to take back control of his band. Hello, Prime members. You can listen to British Scandal ad-free on Amazon Music. Download the Amazon Music app today. Or you can listen ad-free with Wondery Plus in Apple Podcasts. Before you go, tell us about yourself by completing a short survey at wondery.com slash survey. This is the first episode in our series, Death of a Rolling Stone. A quick note about our dialogue. In most cases, we can't know exactly what was said, but all our dramatisations are based on historical research. If you'd like to know more about this story, you can read... Brian Jones, The Untold Life and Mysterious Death of a Rock Legend by Laura Jackson. Life by Keith Richards. And you can watch Rolling Stone, Life and Death of Brian Jones on Amazon Prime. And The Stones and Brian Jones on BBC iPlayer. I'm Alice Levine. And I'm Matt Ford. Lydia Marchant wrote this episode. Additional writing by Alice Levine and Matt Ford. Sound design by Rich Evans. Script editing by James Magniak. British Scandal is produced by Samistat Audio. Our associate producer is Francesca Gilardi Quadrio Corsio. Our producer is Millie Chu. Our senior producer is Joe Sykes. Our executive producers are Theodora Leloudis, Stephanie Jens and Marshall Louis for Wondering.